Well, good morning. Welcome to sunny, beautiful South Florida. I hope you have a great view of the beach from your hotel rooms or wherever you live. Not in Doral. Anyway, my name is Chris Weidler. I'm a researcher slash nurse practitioner slash person of all trades, I think. Um, I am not a firefighter. Never have been. I had the ultimate respect for you. I went the other way. I was a vet. I deployed, spent 23 years in the Army, went to Iraq, ran some medical units over there, came back, retired, and decided that I would be best served to retire to Florida like everybody else in the country. And came down here to retire, be near the oceans, raise the family, all that. And, but I'm a psych NP by trade, and I'm here today with my fellow doctorate slash chaplain slash firefighter slash, what else? All around nice guy? All around good guy, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, doctor, whatever you want to put on the avowal is fine. Yeah, exactly. You know, handsome. Mustache model. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fu Manchu extraordinary. Anyway, but, but anyway, we're here to talk to you about mental health in urban search and rescue firefighters. This applies to all firefighters. We've got some police officers in here, too. Um, and what we want to talk about is what, let me see if I have to go, oh, I have to go back to it. Bear with me. Okay, so myself along with Natasha Sol, is it Sol or Sole? I always call her Sol. Sole. Sole. And Sam Cornerford, his name's easier for me to say. And we're all part of the research study looking at the mental health of first responders. Um, so what we're going to do, just kind of briefly go over that. Again, like, like Phil will tell you in a second, we're kind of like on a quick round robin presentation today. So I only had like 15 minutes to get through some stuff. So if you have questions, come meet me afterwards. But So urban search and rescue is hard to find. It started out in 1989 as a framework for organizing federal, state, and local partners. 28 USAR task forces deployed by FEMA. I'm sure some people are right now in Turkey. I just read the news that there's like 30,000 plus people who've died from an earthquake out in Turkey's Syria border. Um, I'm sure we've sent resources there to support. Um, what you do is you put yourself in general, if the shoe fits where it, generally as a first responder, you put your needs last. You put the needs of someone who's injured, wounded, sick, etc., above your own, many times. When you go out on a call and you go to, let's say, a building collapse uh, or a horrible accident, you see lots of horrible things. You can't just suck it up and drive on, like we used to say in the Army. Just put it aside. We'll deal with it later. It always comes back. Well, unfortunately, for a percentage of first responders, they go on to post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Now, this is about anyway it varies in the research from 8 to 22 percent. The key word is D is for disorder. Disorder means it's interfering with your life, work, social functioning, your family. You can't, you're sleeping too much to you oversleep, you can't go to work. You're drinking too much to hide memories. Things like that. Those go into PTSD, and only then after you have it for six months. Until then, it's an acute stress reaction. Even before that, it might just be an adjustment disorder. If I leave here and I see someone run over by a car, you think it's going to emotionally impact me? Oh yeah. How long is it, is it going to take me to get over it? As long as it needs to be. The problem is when you're doing this job for a living and you're seeing the same thing over and over and over again, or you're seeing horrific things that you just can't put into words. It's just impossible. It sticks with someone. It's at a point where suicidal attempts and suicidal ideations get up to 44%. Last meeting we had someone in here said that in his department they lost three people to suicide in the last several years. There's not a whole lot of study on USAR firefighters and mental health, so that's what we're here for, is to try to understand more what everybody's experiencing and also what we can do to look into to, to see if we can help. Now, you ain't going to talk to some psych nurse from Cincinnati who moved down here and retired. Okay, you want to talk to probably some of your own who've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And that's one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit. Our society wouldn't function without what you do. Be right in the story. Anybody disagree with that? 
You put other people's needs before your own. You put your life sometimes before others, before others' lives. That puts a burden on you. So dealing with that burden is something we have to deal with, help you out with. So Dave Benedict, this guy I worked with at Walter Reed back in the 90s, Fullerton and Ursano, who I've never met, they published an article back in 2007. And they came up with three categories for people who are first responders as far as how they deal with mental health and mental illness. To surmise, and this is very PhD, doctoral level talking, it's mild, moderate, and severe. Three categories. Most people experience mild, transient distress. It comes and goes. You think about it. You go into a burning building and you see something and it brings back memories but you're able to process it and deal with it. You go, and that's the mild part. Moderate, smaller group of people in that group, and have it continue on for a while. And they have to figure out ways to deal with it. They're having things like insomnia. Anybody go to bed every night or any other night and think about work that day and replay it? And then you say, oh, I'm gonna get some sleep. I'm not gonna think about work. What do you do? Think about work. And even that, a smaller subgroup may develop a psychiatric illness such as PTSD disorder or major depressive disorder, meaning it impairs them. They can't do their job. This doesn't mean we don't have triggers. I spent 27 months at the sandbox. Iraq was just like South Florida when people ask me. Hot, sandy, intermittent palm trees and intermittent gunfire. But that being said, I've seen some horrible things as all of you have. And I have triggers. Helicopters don't make me comfortable. Smelling that smell of burnt flesh doesn't make me comfortable. Those are things that trigger an emotion because our memories are very strong. Now, you have to learn how to process those appropriately so it's not affecting your outcome of your life. So with first responders, there are some trends that we have seen. The lower the rank, the less time you're in surface, service. If you have another comorbid condition, such as cancer, or assigned to an all-volunteer fire department, you, this is a no kidding question. EMS is on your fire department. <coughs> and responding to suicide, seeing someone else who committed suicide successfully. Um, those are people who are more at risk for developing mental health concerns. On general, several studies have looked at it, saying that firefighters in general, 13 to 18% have suicidal thoughts after a long term response, such as what happened in Surfside. And here's a Venn diagram of how it literally works. Mental health and illness, some people have problems. It affects them for a long time. Some people have subclinical distress. You remember it, you deal with it. And then finally, changing your behavior to avoid it. He's going to talk a lot about avoidance in a second. Anybody go to the mall now? Anybody like going to the mall? Didn't like going to the mall before, didn't mind, but now you don't do it, do you? Too many crowds, too many people. So the government, this is off of congress.gov, I found. It says that, yes, we want to take care of the first responders, firefighters. Coordinated approach would be great. Mental health prevention treatment service address any gaps in care. This might include attention to the cause, the course of mental health for prevention to treatment and recovery. Where does it say on here who's doing this, this treatment? Who's providing it? So, I'm sure you're all aware, some of you might have been there at the uh, Surfside building collapse. We had people from all over the country come, uh, from the USAR team, and the things that were seen there were quite effective, they were quite emotional, as you can imagine. So, we decided to do a qualitative study. What's a qualitative study, if you don't know? It's not talking to people. I like to call it a touchy-feely study. Quantitative is numbery, you know, how many times this happened, all that. So we're doing a qualitative. We're talking to people about what's going on and what's their experience. And so we looked at people, 18, speak English, firefighters, who were USAR. We started doing focus groups, looked at demographics, did it online, mostly over private Zoom chats in a video. And not taking names or anything like that, but we're looking at just what people are saying from around the nation. 
and how they deal with it. And these are some of the topics that we looked at. Start conversation, what are your experiences, what have you done? That's too small for anybody to read, so I'll skip through it for now. We're looking, right now it's higher than 24, I think we're closer to 45. Uh, but on average, 45 years old and 20. And it, it runs the gambit from chief, assistant chief, captain, lieutenant, all the way down to <coughs> medical team manager. I don't know why they put deputy chief at the bottom. I'll have to look at that. And what did we find out so far? And it's still ongoing, but initially, three topics came up. Health and safety, USAR training, and resources. So USAR training, deployments are mentally and physically challenging. No kidding. Are you able to turn off your home life and just focus on the deployment when you're there? And then you have to go back and focus on the home life and what's been gone while you're there? We also looked at long-term health. Generally, you all, in, in general, firefighters, first responders, deal with your stress at the fire station. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But what happens when you retire? Are you going to go back to work just to talk to people? So we want to look at that. We look at USAR training. Is there something that we can recommend or implement in training to get people to learn about mental health and taking care of, someone said in the last group, care from the neck and above. Take care of that area. And then look at resources. A lot of departments, not all, put some, a lot of money towards mental health treatment and prevention. Some, not so much. It's very, there's no real standard that I've at least seen. So we want to look at what's worked, and we want to hear from you what's worked well, what's not worked. Here are some of the quotes people have said. Um, the stigma is still there. It takes decades to get over it. People feel broken if they talk to a mental health provider. The camaraderie and common, is a common ground that keeps time together on shift, that keeps people focused. So, We've had a lot of positive feedback, but we want to figure out where to go. What's the best way that once we conclude the study, where do we go next? Now, I know that there aren't enough healthcare, mental health care providers in the world to attach one to every firehouse. I wish that were the case. But you do have medical experts who might be able to be trained up on it. A lot of people don't like outsiders. That's why we. We brought him along. He's a firefighter, and a chaplain, and a PhD professor, and an all-around nice guy. <laughs> so we're looking at maybe looking at some qualitative and quantitative research in the future, but we need your input. What? I can, I can tell you what we're hearing, but what are some recommendations that you see? Do you have robust mental health programs at your, your firehouses? Or not? Some of you are in leadership positions. You have other people lean on you with their mental issues, their stress. Who do you lean on? I guarantee half of you don't go home and tell your spouse or significant other, right? Which is a nice segue to me to bring it over to this young gentleman. So, so far we've got young. <laughs> Take notes. Mm -hmm. uh, all around good guy. I think so. Thank we you. Are yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. I can't lie to you. He's better. Trust me, he's, he's funny. Funny? It's, a, it's the mustache. It's more adjectives. By the way, I looked up the Rolodex on Amazon. Yeah, how much was it? Fifty-three dollars. See, that's stupid. Thirty percent on sale now today. Only thirty-five or something. I should sell them. You should. We should be good Rolodex salesmen. So my name is uh, Derek Edwards. Uh, I have been in the fire service for eighteen years. I have the privilege at my university, so I'm a Assistant Professor of Psychology. I have the privilege of my university of being the principal investigator of my lab, uh, the Responder Health Lab. Uh, I tell folks we research things from cancer to suicide, some happy crap in the middle, uh, but I often travel around and I talk mostly about mental health. So in the state of Tennessee, I'm a licensed professional counselor, mental health service provider, so if right now you wanted to go ahead and slide your insurance cards to the center, <laughs> we'll go ahead and get this started, and that would be, <laughs> or checks, and you don't, you don't want to get your insurance involved, that's fine. I get that. I, I, can't, I can't spell the word stress. Uh, the formatting got weird, so let's just bear with me for a minute. Um, why do we talk about stress in the fire service? Well, it's because it's not getting less. In fact, it's getting more and more and more. What happened in the fire service around 30 years ago was this push that we're going to start running medical calls. 
Uh, and that's the result of what was the greatest fire reduction prevention campaign in, in the planet, right? So it used to be, if you've got some of those old timer guys, they're, they're going to tell you every shift we ran work and structure fire. I, and I'm talking small departments, every shift they're running a call. We sprinkle the buildings, we build them out of stuff that's hard to burn. People are trying to burn stuff down these days and we, we can catch them. Like think about that. Like that's pretty, that's pretty remarkable. So medical calls come in and they, they say like, well, well clearly these people are just going to call 911 when they have a true life-threatening emergency, right? Is that not what they do? How many of you have gotten off the truck, you've got a medical bag in your hand, before your second boot hits the ground you hear, well I don't really want to go to the hospital. Well you called the wrong number. Like there, there are people, you know, it, it's one of these things. Well the problem with this is we're hearing more tones than we've ever heard in the fire service. You are getting called to more calls for service than you ever were. And every time the tones drop, your brain can't determine, is this a real emergency or is this a typical non-911 call? It doesn't know the difference. And every time the tones drop, your brain says, let's get ready, let's do it. Every time. Stress goes up and up and up. There's a really cool, uh, not cool for us, but a, a really cool concept known as allostasis, where our homeostasis center of ourself actually increases to stay more prepared for stress responses. We see this in some brain structures too, like your amygdala, your amygdala which are looking for danger. They're, they're, they're just always ready, right? You, get, you might have a hyperstarter response. You probably, when you go to a restaurant, you probably sit with your back to the wall where you can see the door. You go eat with your family enough, they don't even ask which chair you want. You just go to where they put you and you're like, this is better, you know? You think that at Chili's, like, there's gonna be a terrorist bump, jump into the baby back rib section. Like, that doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Well, the way that we deal with stress is called coping. What I'd like you to do is scan this based on our new speed dating format here at this <coughs> conference. You don't have time to take it, so scan it. And then I'd like you to save it to a tab. I'll get out of the way. My head puts a reflection. I get it. So we believe people cope broadly in one of four ways that we call MEPS. Mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. And at the end of this survey, you're going to get some scores. Your highest number is your primary coping mechanism. I will go ahead and give you some spoiler alerts, which you already know. What do you think the primary coping mechanism for the fire service is? Alcohol. Uh, no, no, no. Got to be one of these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we call that a Freudian slip. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> My name's <Jesus>. Fred. <laughs> Which one of these do you think is primary for the fire service? Physical. Physical. Why? You work out. That's what, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Physical, yes, absolutely. Hey, what's the number one reason we get put off work? Physical injury. So I, I like to say, if I'm a physical coper and I have been physically injured, then I am physically screwed. There's no way around it. You know your primary coping mechanism is probably physical. It's either going to be physical or mental. That's just how this game, this game works. I'm interested in what your second one is because you need a check down. Because sometimes your primary coping mechanism doesn't work for what you need it to do, especially when we're talking about physical coping. You might only have access to your, uh, to your department's gym equipment, and you've got some weird policy because an attorney somewhere has never done our job. It says if you're off work, you can't come to the fire hall because you might trip and fall and sue everybody. And now you're just sitting at home, and you don't know what your number two coping skill is. Now, mine is mental, based on the everything about me. You probably kind of figured that. I'm the guy in that intersection when the car seat's upside down. i got to flip it over. That's who I am. I have to see. Because I know, no matter what's in there, is going to be better than what I've created in my brain. Right? I'm a mental coper. But there are times where I can't wrap my brain around it. There's times where I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And I tell my brain, like, well, like it's fine, it doesn't make any sense. And my brain is like, no, 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 I need to know why. I'm a wire, so I need my check down. My check down even becomes physical coping. So the way that we cope with stress is what is very similar to the way that we process alcohol. So whether you take one shot of tequila or ten shots of tequila, your body's getting rid of tequila at the same rate, right? You, you understand this concept pretty well. You take ten, ten shots of tequila, you're not processing alcohol any differently, you're just processing tomorrow a little differently. The only difference. We cope in that same type of zero order elimination, the same idea that we can only cope with so much stress within a given period. And if we understand how we cope, then we can understand some errors that we might run into. Let's say that I go into a high CO environment. When I come out of that environment, if I wasn't using breathing protection, what's now in my bloodstream? CO, yeah, right. How long is it going to be there? Yeah, th three days. So tomorrow, I go back into that same CO environment. Can I stay in there as long as I did the first time with no effect? 
You hear how that residual starts to build? Another way to look at this for my divers in the room is like you have a deep dive with a long bottom time. What you brought with you to the surface is a whole lot of nitrogen in it. And your next dive can't be as deep or as long. You've got this residual coming in. And what happens is we're running more and more calls is we're only burning off the same amount of stress units. And we go back to our next shift. None of you have a second job. None of you ever work mandated overtime. I understand. You're all taking really good care of yourself. Or not. Instead, we go back into work the next day, still trying to blow off some of these stress units. So what happens when we have uncoped stress is something Christina Maslach calls strain. Uncoped stress equals strain. Strain prolonged leads to something that I'm sure you've heard of called burnout. Burnout is emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a feeling, diminished sense of personal accomplishment. This is where, as a mental health professional in the fire service, I start working with people who are really struggling. Right? They're, they're struggling because they're losing all of their ability to cope that burnout is now taking more of them. Right? Burnout says we're not going to cope at all anymore. So now these stress units keep piling up, don't they? Because it doesn't matter if we had a bad day when the tones drop, we go. It doesn't matter if we had a bad day and we go home, we still have to be a husband or a father or a wife or a spouse or a sister or something. We've we got to be a person and we're still getting exposed to these stress, these stress units. So one of the things that we recognize is that we are actually pretty good copers. If you've been in the service for longer than five years, you're what we call an inherently resilient person, which is a badge of honor. Like, that's, that's a good thing. The problem with being inherently resilient means you probably never learned how to cope. When you were younger, you just kind of went with it. Go with the flow kind of people. And as you eventually needed your coping skills, it was kind of like me the first time I took organic chemistry. I realized I had never learned how to study. I never had to study until I got there. And then I was like, oh, crap, I might be dumb. <laughs> and it's way too late at that point for you to say, oh, I'm going to learn how to cope right now. That's why I think you need to learn how you cope and start, start working on that. So we, we deal with this idea of uh, an inherently resilient. One of the things that we do that, that uh, helps us cope is we use dark gallows humor. If anybody ever comes to your fire hall, a therapist, a chaplain, whoever, and they tell you to stop using this humor, I want you to run them out of your fire hall. They don't know you. You don't want to know them. Let's give them a southern bless your heart and be done with them, okay? <laughs> they, don't, they don't get it. We have to objectify our reality because the things that we're asked to do are insane. If we're not objectifying our reality, we can't perform our job. I am not the therapist who says, all right, guys, look, before we go in, let's all hold hands. Let's share a deep truth. No, that's ridiculous. We're going to go in. We're going to do our job. The problem is when we get done with our job, we have to step out of that objectification route. We have to then start processing what we've experienced. And that's where we fall short. So uh, something I want you to remember, I want you to write it down. If you don't have a writing stick, get a writing stick. Or if you want to use some type of phone, that's fine. If you want to write this straight on your forehead, I think that would be even better. Because I think this is the most important thing I could ever teach you. And it's relatively simple. Avoid avoidance at all costs. If you were to ask any of my students at Tennessee Tech University, what does Dr. Edwards say about avoidance? Two things will happen. Thing one, their eyes will roll in the back of their head. And they will say with a mocking voice, avoid avoidance at all costs. And then they'll be struck in the throat by, no, never mind. <laughs> avoid avoidance at all costs. I think you inherently know that we need to avoid avoidance, but let me demonstrate it. I have two kids, a son and a daughter. My daughter's younger. She's eight. Let's say that tonight she says, Daddy, there's a monster in my closet. Pray tell, what should I do? Help me. This is the interactive portion. What should I do? Go to the closet. Absolutely. What if I tell her to get in bed with me? What have I told her? I told her two things. One, you're only safe with daddy. She's eight. That's cute as all get out. Ten years from now, mm-mm. Right. I'm going to have a healthful retirement, and she's not living there. All right? <laughs> she comes to visit. It's cute. She loves me. She says I'm the best dad ever, but she goes to her house where she goes, and that's going to be great. Thing two, I'm telling her that there's a monster in her closet, which is terrifying. So what do I do? I walk her to her room. And I'm old school and afraid of the dark a little bit, so she's going to have to open the door. She puts her hand out towards that door handle. She throws it open. What's in there? Well, look, I know I'm in the fire service. We're not that broke. She's got clothes. You don't have to call anybody, right? Just clothes, some shoes, probably some stuffed animals. No monster. I don't like to make promises. As a therapist, I, I don't like to make promises. As a fireman, I don't like to make promises. When I'm on an ambulance, I sure don't like to make promises. But I'm going to make you a promise today. And I can guarantee it. Put a stamp on it. You never have to run that call again. Ever. 
You might have to run similar calls. Absolutely. But that call, the one that you're thinking of right now, because I lowered my low voice a little bit, made you lean in, I'm a therapist. That call, you never have to run it again. There is no monster in that closet. So if I tell Elizabeth to get in bed with me, what will happen tomorrow night? What if she does it for a month? I can, yeah, I can turn her room into any useless room I want, like a home gym or something like that. She's never going back. Yet, I work with a lot of firemen who, I don't drive that way to work anymore. I, I, don't, I don't go that way. The problem is when we drive through our hometowns, we don't see intersections and houses anymore, do we? We see what happened in that intersection and what went down in that house. It's, a, it's an augmented reality. No one else in the car with you sees the body in the intersection. You know it's not there, but you can't not see it. As we embrace avoidance, we are not getting better. Just like you instinctively knew that Elizabeth is going to get worse with her fear about sleeping in her bed if she doesn't go uh, open that closet, you know that as we do that, it's going to take more and more and more of our life. And that's why this man has an alcohol problem. That was a little bit forward, sorry. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> alcohol. I'm going to drink so I don't have to feel this. If you think that you're actually going to solve an issue by getting drunk, you are saying that you are the first person on earth to have ever figured this out. I tell husbands, you have a better shot of winning an argument with your wife by accusing her of being her mother than you do of solving a problem with alcohol. Try it. You give it a go. Like, I bet you'll lose that argument every time. Because this avoidant coping mechanism means, well, I just need it a little bit so I can go to sleep. Well, now I need it every night so I can go to sleep. You know, when I, just when I get home, I just, you know, it'll just help me a little bit. Maybe if I just, a little bit more, keeps taking her, I'm far from a teetotaler, y'all. Look, I know I'm a chaplain. I drink. Like, I don't see a problem with it. But not one of us has ever solved a problem through alcohol. This is avoidant coping. I believe that phrase is oxymoronic. In other words, avoidant coping doesn't exist. It's not real. It's a myth. Something that we told you. So what we have to do is embrace this. This is called a Rolodex. If you don't know what a Rolodex is, get out of here and never talk to me again. If you, if you bring this to your department, you're going to have some young people who've never heard of a Rolodex. Bless their hearts too, okay? But you might want to talk to them about it. You can buy one. $53. $53. What's on sale today for $35? You can buy a Walkman for a nickel. You know, $53. How many Rolodexes do you have available on your iPhone? Like this is, it's the little things that really set me over the edge. So just bear with me. Every time the tones drop, you punch a Rolodex card. Every time. From stub toe to imminent delivery, which is not a fun one at all, to bodies everywhere. Every time you punch a Rolodex card. The benign calls, the one where you get there and she's like, yeah, for like the past 20 years, I've just been feeling like this general malaise. So I figured at 3 a.m. I would call 911. <laughs> like that call? On the way back to the fire hall, you guys are all talking about that call, aren't you? And probably not like, well, isn't she a sweet lady? You know, you, you're blessing for sure, you know, but you're processing it. And your brain says, oh, I've got a file for these types of calls. It stores it away. But there's that call. Yeah, we're back to that one again. And when it punches a Rolodex card and it puts it in front of your mind's eye, you say, oh, no, 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 I ain't dealing with that one. I don't want to think about that anymore. We push it aside. It's fine because you have to work another shift, you have to work on another call, and you punch another one of those Rolodex cards. Now you've got a stack of them. And your brain says, hey, I really need to know where you want me to file this. And you say, well, I'm not dealing with that. Push it away. I really need to know where to file this. And it pushes it away. Let's say I'm in my living room. And my wife comes in and she says, Derek. That's convenient because my name is Derek. She says somebody else has a different problem. So she says, Derek, and I don't answer her. What will she, what will she do next? She'll say it like Derek, right? Yeah. Now, for this next part, you need to understand my wife was a corrections officer for quite a while. So let's assume that I still don't answer my wife. What will she do? She goes hands-on pretty quick. All right. Just uh, We're going to go from zero to uh, I'm in trouble before I even know it's happening, right? Why doesn't she just go away? Clearly, I'm ignoring her. Yeah. Yeah. Just like her mother. She won't leave anything alone. You see how... Don't ever repeat. I'm nervous. You're being reported. <laughs> the idea... Uh, her going away is insane. We call this an ironic process. You can't think about not thinking about something. This is the premise of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Every kid went to bed and said, don't think about Freddy. What do they think about? 
You can't think about not thinking about something. When this Rolodex card comes to your mind's eye and you say, oh, I'm not going to deal with that, eventually it becomes Internet 2.0. And it says, hey, based on your previous browser history, what about these calls? Is this where you want me to put it? And that knob starts to turn, doesn't it? And it's not that one call you're seeing anymore, is it? It's the greatest hits of calls that are very similar. It's not that child drowning. It's every child drowning you've ever worked. And it's your brain saying, what about here? You want me to put it here? And we, no, no, I don't want to deal with that. And we become so engulfed in our avoidance that we never, and then this is the phrase I need you to remember, give reverence to the reverend. It sounds chaplain-y, but I promise it isn't. Giving reverence to the reverend. That means when that Rolodex card comes to your mind's eye, what I need you to do is read it and recognize that that was a big deal. Everything you saw, felt, smelt, tasted, and the worst, heard. Give it reverence. Pause and say, this was a big deal. And not only my life, but this person's life. We get on scene, and our only job is to put them in a bag. We've all been there. It's a reverent moment. Our job was a very reverent moment. And when we give it that reverence, what happens is our brain says, Roger that. I know where to put that. I promise you, you'll never run that call again. But I also promise you'll never forget it. The blessing of our memories. Traumatic memories are a lot like scars. We'll always know that we have them. And when you see your scars, you can easily tell me how you got it. It just hurts a lot less. You don't feel that injury anymore in the same way that you did. But you give reverence and pause. In the same way every scar that you've received was a reverent moment in your life. It was a meaningful story. It truly marked you forever. And you can call it back up today, sitting here. You're thinking about a scar right now. And you don't have to relive that injury. When we tell this Rolodex, I'm going to, I'm going to give reverence to the reverence. It will file it away. And when it files it away, it'll be there. And there will be things that will make you think of it. It will become part of the greatest hits. Well, that knob spins and it'll tell us, hey, you know, I'm probably not processing the way I should. So how do we do this? First thing I want you to do is I want you to scan this and save it to a tab. You do not have time to do this today and you need to do this when you're alone. What you're going to get access to is every mental health screener that exists in the DSM-5. In no way, shape, or form, it's very important, in no way, shape, or form am I issuing, issuing you a diagnosis at the end of this screener. But it is going to tell you your results. It'll say things like, hey, on the depression screening, you scored a blank out of blank. And that might mean fill in the blank here. I'm a G.I. Joe era kid. I believe knowledge is power. And what you do with that depression score, that's on you. If you want to go talk to somebody about it, that's great. But what I find is that more often than not, when I simply know what's going on with me, I feel a little better. Number one and two coping styles in the fire service are physical and mental. And do you hear how this whole knowledge is power really feeds into one of those? It might be the first time you've had to reconcile with yourself that you're struggling with your anxiety. It might be the first time you need to reconcile with yourself that you might be drinking to modulate your emotions. And that is the intervention. All of the gold standard treatments for, uh, uh, for trauma are exposure-based in nature. We don't have a single treatment that is effective that involves you forgetting that call you're still thinking about. <clears throat> but I promise you, you never have to run that call again. Similar, sure, but not that one. It's done. Cool study with paramedics. Uh, dual paramedic trucks, same patient, same call, same everything. They stabilize the patient in the back. One of them has to drive into the hospital, right? We know how ambulances work. Turns out the paramedic who writes the trip ticket that has the narrative has better stress outcomes than the paramedic who drove them into the hospital. Giving reverence to the reverend. Think about how detailed those stupid tickets are. Everything you did is documented right there, isn't it? And earlier, I said, I need you to give reverence to the reverence, recalling everything you did. Now, listen, I'm not telling you to go start doing reports. I'm saying give reverence to the reverence. Mm -hmm. Write it out, station talk, peer support, go to a professional, whatever you have to do. I encourage people to embrace the awkward. Right? Like, hey, are you okay? I know this is awkward. Or, man, I met this weird therapist and he would have a, such a big time. Like, what, I don't care what you say. Whatever you say that starts this conversation, 
That's awesome. What I don't want you to worry about is what you're going to do when they say they're not doing well. Your number one job is the installation of hope. And when you ask someone how they're doing, you're giving them that thing. You're breaking this burden and you're allowing them to be seen. There's no harm. There's no harm. Things I want you to take away. What do we do with avoidance? I will redo this lecture. I will lock the doors and I will give a 50 question test. Yeah, we're going to try again for the slow folks in the room. Okay? It's on the screen, by the way. Avoid avoidance. At, At all costs. At all costs. Every time the chums drop, you're punching a Rolodex card. And what do I want you to do with that card? Read it. Give reverence to the reverend. Doing these things, relatively simple. And if we do them as we go, we don't have a big stack to get through. Again, a lot like run tickets, right? You haven't done a report in six shifts. You get back to the station and you're like, that's a lot of reports. Some of you are carrying around a pretty big stack of Rolodex cards. Start anywhere. The one that comes up. The next one. Start there. What questions do you have for me? You go on the road? I travel all over, yeah. <laughs> yeah mostly stand up, some stripping. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you seen a difference since it, and it, it dovetails well with your, your work at the, the college? Have you seen a difference in reaction due to preparation with younger adults that, that perhaps haven't had any experience coming into emergency services? Yeah, so we really enjoy picking on the, the younger generation. The problem is we have mowed the path straight and made it wide for them. Absolutely. They are uh, probably not inherently resilient, but they've also never had to learn how to cope, right? So I, I think that's really important. And it's one of those things that, that, that I, hopefully I said in this, this weird when you're doing four of the same things in a row, so bear with me. But when that rookie is, is complaining, he's learning it from somewhere, right? Which means they're going to learn these positive behaviors from us as well. Um, that, that generation is, is quite reactive, but also averted to struggle. Right? Grit used to be that term we all researched, right? Uh, grit and resilience, and we got it from the military. That, that, that idea of what's your toughness? Uh, and the only way we get that toughness and that grit is through, like, I mean, lots of exposure to things that you need to be tough about. And that's it's going to take time. So what I would encourage you to do is, as like a, a more seasoned firefighter in your department, um, instead of just trying to force them to be tougher, support them in the process. They are being refined with every call, right? With every call, they're being refined. Trust that they will be refined into a, into a, a more resilient state. What else? Chris and I both have cards, and we are real people. Um, like you. Most times. Sometimes, yes. Uh, you have the thought that uh, the chaplains need a chaplain too, so to speak. Amen. Uh, what are you doing in your area or state to, you know, have a coalition of chaplains, anything like that? Because Florida's just starting. That. Your BHAP program, uh, which is going to be great, by the way. Uh, so in Tennessee, we have the uh, Tennessee Disaster Mental Health Strike Team. We're a statewide deplo deployable uh, team. Uh, there's 160 of us who are on the team, um, and we uh, we travel different departments doing debriefings, diffusing, diffusings, and then I'm I'm one of the team clinicians, uh, so we have we have clinicians, and then we have each other, and that's a that's a requirement to be a part of the team. You have to uh, uh, engage with your other members in these kind of debriefings of the debriefings. It's it's and it's essential, right? Um, one of the things that, that we're guilty of in the mental health side is the same thing we're all guilty of. We just kind of shoulder it and pretend it's going to go away. It, it has to go somewhere. Luckily, I'm a mental coper. So when I'm doing therapy, I'm coping, right? Like, that's how I cope. Uh, if I can talk it out, if I can figure it out, I'm going to feel better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes it's just talking. You know, we used to call it, you, know, you don't want to take the easy left. You have to do the hard right. And, you know... It may feel good to get drunk. You may go see somebody and they'll give you pills like Xanax or Ativan or Clonopin or whatever. They're all benzodiazepines. They're all essentially, they work like alcohol in a pill form. Doesn't fix the problem. Just helps you get through that situation. So talk. 
talk to somebody. Ideally, someone who's been there walk the walk, talk to talk, wear the same t-shirt, but talk to somebody. We are not your best option, and that's not an indictment on either of us, no. right? As professionals, we are not the best option for your people. You are. You are the primary best case scenario for them, and we are like old school jumpers, trampolines. Mm -hmm. Like last ditch, here we go. It's still gonna hurt. We're the Rolodex. Yeah. You come to my you come to my office for therapy. I promise you, I'm just gonna pull out a Rolodex card and show it to you. That, that's and that's what our therapy will look like for as long as you need it. You're gonna write out that call, that one you're still thinking of, in as much detail as possible. Then we're gonna read it out loud, and I'm gonna say, hey. You got really short with your sentences right here. Why don't you write that again? And then again. And then again. Hey, thank you all for being here. If we can help in any way.